Welcome once again, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 6. We're going to be reading about how Jesus was talking about how a prophet is without honor. There are different certain circumstances where a prophet does not receive any honor. Also, Jesus sends out the 12. John the Baptist gets beheaded, and Jesus feeds the 5,000, and Jesus walks on the water. So, let's get right into this. This is Mark chapter 6, verse 1. He, speaking of Jesus, went out from there. Okay, again, let's always remember that we're talking about, we're coming from Mark chapter 5. And I've said, I've said this many times before, but the original manuscripts here in, in you know, all of the Bible, as far as I understand, it was never written in chapters and verses. It was all just, every book, letter, scroll was just all one document without any, it was not divided up. So this just, this just flows from just the last chapter, it flows right through. He went out from there, and he came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And hearing many, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did, the, where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom that is given to this man, that such mighty works come about by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joses, Judah, and Simon? So in the Hebrew, uh, the, the actual literal Hebrew names would be Yaakov, Yoshe, Yehuda, and Simon. Okay, Aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Think about it for a second here before we read on. Think about it for a second. Here's Jesus. He's coming in. It says here, when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. When many hearing uh, were astonished and said, where did, the, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom that is given to this man that such mighty works are, came about by his hands? Why? How did he know this stuff? How did he have so much power to do all these miracles? You know, don't we saw him growing up as a little child? We know him. We know his family. Like we know he's not some mighty, you know, celebrity or god or whatever. That's the way they're thinking. Okay, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Miriam, the brother of Yaakov, Yoshe, um, Yehuda, and Shimon? Aren't his sisters here with us? Like they're. He's just one of us, isn't he? So they were offended at him. Isn't it amazing how people can get offended at you if you are better than them? I mean, it just, if you're jealous, you are proving to the world that you are inferior. Verse 4 Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own relatives and in his own house. They, I guess they call it the sin of, in today, they call it the sin of familiarity. Verse 5, he could, do mo, he could do no mighty work there except that he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. He went around the villages teaching. This is his thing. He wants to teach. He called to himself the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey except for a staff, take no bread, no wallet, no money in their purse, but to wear sandals uh, and to put on two tunics. Why is this? Because you see, in those days, people would go from house to house, you know, and they would, or from village to village, that they would find a place to, to, uh, to stay in that place that when they stayed there, they would work for those people doing whatever, I mean, work in the field, work, you know, whatever they would have to do, whatever they would do, work for those people. And and the people they were staying with would feed them and clothe them because of, you know, as an appreciation for the work that they did. So this was their work. That's why Jesus said, don't take anything, you know, don't take your staff, your bread, wallet, 
money, all this kind of stuff, because you don't need it. You're going to be going from house, you know, from this house over here in this city to that house over here in that city, from this house over here in this city, to, you know, into that house over there in that city. And you're going to be staying at those house, houses. You're going to be working for those families. You're going to be serving them. You're going to be doing what needs to be done uh, for them. And, uh, and they're going to be blessing you. Okay. And you need to work for your living. Okay. This is what Jesus said, basically. Verse 10, he said to them, wherever you enter into a house, stay there until you depart from there. So there are houses that these people would go to, to, to live there while they were there. Okay. Whoever will not receive you nor hear you as you depart from there, shake off the dust that is under your feet for a testimony against them. I mean, that, that would probably be quite offensive, don't you think? Don't you think people would be quite offended at that if, if you had a visitor at your house and, and as they left, they, hate, they protested against you so much, they, just, they, they wiped the bottom of their feet. They, took, they, wanted, they wiped the dirt off the bottom of their feet as a testimony against you. Now, even the dirt from, your, from the bottom, of their, even the dust from the bottom of your feet, even the dust of your house is not worthy to be, to, to, uh, to be on their shoes. Surely I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Think about that again for a little bit. Let's just put a little bit of thought into this instead of just you know, rhyming through this really fast. How tolerable was God of Sodom and Gomorrah? He wasn't tolerable at all, was he? He let them get to a state of corruption that I mean, he let them get very corrupt to begin with. They got very corrupt, very, very immoral. And God, you know, because of the prayers of the people, uh, God uh, answered those prayers. I mean, listen, you want to know who to be afraid of? Be afraid of the people that you don't like so much, the people that are telling you to repent, the people that are really good with God, that are godly people, that are righteous people, be afraid of them. Why? Because God hears their prayers. If God pray, if, if, if they pray to God against you because of your immorality, you think that it's just love. You think that it's just normal. If they pray to God against you, if they're right, God will hear them. And you don't want to be on the receiving end on that. I, I, you know, you know what? <laughs> Look what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. The same thing as what he did to Pompeii. Not that long ago. I mean, all things considered. Sodom and Gomorrah was completely destroyed by God. Completely destroyed by God. But God, Jesus said, if you go into the, to the, the houses of these people, if you go into the cities of these people, you're preaching repentance. You're preaching against sin. And if they don't listen to you, if they don't receive your word, If they reject you, if they hate you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for them. Why? Because they have the Bible now. They have the words in red. They have a lot more responsibility. They have a lot more information than Sodom and Gomorrah ever had. They have the responsibility of looking to Sodom and Gomorrah and learning. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city, for that city who, who re rejects your message. Oh, it's just hate. I can just... <sighs> hate against who? What about hate against God? What the Bible says is love, and what the Bible says is hate. Verse 12, they went out and preached that people should repent. There we go. 
What was the first message of the 12 disciples when Jesus sent them out? The first thing that they, that they preached, their primary message, verse 12, read it yourself. They went out and preached that people should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many with oil who were sick and healed them. Why? How did he cast out the evil spirits? How did they heal the sick? How did they do these great miracles? Because people listened to their message and they were humble enough. They didn't get offended. They didn't let pride get in the way. They, they were not offended. They were humble enough to hear the message of repentance, to, to repent of their sin, and they got right with God, and then God healed them of all of their demons, evil spirits, their sicknesses, all everything that they needed, they got from God. Verse 14, King Herod heard this, for the name, for his name had become known. And he said, John the baptizer has risen from the dead, and therefore these powers at work, at, at work in him. Isn't it interesting that, that Herod was, he seemed to be somewhat of a believer, okay? As evil as he was, he seemed to be somewhat of a believer because if he wasn't a believer, why would he say, oh, wow, wow, what's going on? This Jesus is really John the Baptist risen from the dead. Must be. He trusted John the Baptist to be such a man of God. He knew that John the Baptist was such a man of God that he feared that Jesus was actually John the Baptist risen from the dead. Think about that for a minute. But others said, he is Elijah. He's Eliyahu. Others said he's, he is a prophet or like one of the prophets. But Herod, when he heard this, said, This is John, whom I beheaded, whom I beheaded for he has risen from the dead. You, it's got to make you wonder a little bit. Why did he, why was he so convinced that this was John? I think one of the things that made him so convinced is that the message of Jesus was the same as the message that John preached. Repentance. It's the first thing, it's the first thing he preached. It's what he preached all the way through. He preached against, he preached against sin. He, pre, he preached hard and heavy against uh, uh, hypocrites, sin. People say he's a friend of sinners. How can he be such a friend of sinners? He said he preached so much against sin and hypocrisy and evil. He said, the world hates me because I testify its deeds are evil. He said that in the book of John. We're going to get to it. Why, did, why was Herod so convinced that Jesus was actually John risen from the dead? Because they had the same message. Perhaps they even looked alike. Verse 17, for Herod himself has sent out and arrested John and bound him in, in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John said to Herod, it is not lawful. It's not according, it's not according to God's law. It's not according to the Torah for you to have your brother's wife. And this is one of the many points, and I'll have to make a whole separate video on this, another whole separate teaching on this some other time. But this is another point that I would say to, to those who say the Torah is only for the Jewish people. Correct me if I'm wrong in the, in the, in the comments. Herod wasn't a Jew. Okay. But John held him responsible for obeying Torah. Verse 19, Herodias sent herself set herself against him John the Baptist and desired to kill him but she couldn't for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe when he when he uh, heard him he did many things and 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 he heard he heard him gladly then a convenient day came that Herod on his birthday made a supper for the no, for his nobles his noble men the high officers and the chief men of Galilee, when the daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and those sitting with him. You got to you got to think about that. Must have been some dance. 
The king said to the, to the young lady, Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. He swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? She said, The head of John the baptizer. She came in immediately with haste to the king, ran in, ran in fast and said, I want you to give me right now the head of John the baptizer on a platter. That's some woman, isn't it? The king was exceedingly sorry because he knew John the Baptist was a righteous man. There was nothing wrong with him. He knew that John the Baptist was a holy man, but for the sake of his oaths, And of his dinner guests, he wanted to look good for everybody. He didn't wish to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent out a soldier of his guard and commanded to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the young lady. And the young lady gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard this, they came and took up his corpse his body, and laid it into a tomb. The apostles gathered themselves together to Jesus, and they told him all all things, whatever they had done and whatever they had taught. He said to them, You come apart into a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much so much as to eat. They went away into a, the boat to a deserted place by themselves. They, uh, the TR, the text of Receptus Manuscripts, reads the multitudes instead of they, saw them going and, may, and many recognized him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. Jesus came out, saw a great multitude, and had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was late in the day, his disciples came to him and said, This place is deserted, and it is late in the day. We're out in the middle of nowhere, guys, and it's late. Send them away. That, that, uh, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, and, for they have nothing to eat. But Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. It reminds me of Moses on the edge of the Red Sea. You know, Moses is complaining to God, hey, the, 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 the Pharaoh's army is ganging up on us. They're surrounding us. You know, what are we, and Jesus, and Moses, um, the Lord said to Moses, you stretch out your hand. You stretch out your hand and divide the sea. <gasps> Why do you cry to me, says the Lord? Why are you crying to me? You do it. Jesus said, pretty much, it's almost like the same thing. You give them something to eat. And they asked him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii? 200 denarii was about seven or eight months wages for an agricultural laborer, it says here in the notes. Seven or eight months worth, uh, seven or eight months, months of you know salary wages worth of of bread and give them something to eat he said to them how many loaves do you have go see when they knew they said five and two fish five loaves of bread and two fish he commanded them that everyone should sit down in groups on the green grass they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves and gave to his disciples and set before them, and he divided the the two fish among them all. They all ate and were filled. They took up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces and also the two fish, and also of the fish. Those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Okay? This does not include women or children if they were there, okay? you got to realize that in the numbers in the book, in, in the Bible, a lot of times the numbers we read here uh, is only counting the men, 
That was all counting. You look at, through the scriptures, it talks about so many thousand here, so many thousand there. It talked about the men, not the ladies or the children, just the men. Verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side, to Beth- Beth- Bethsaida, while he himself sent the multitude away. Uh, that's a little bit of a, wouldn't it be a little bit of a downer, right, to have Jesus send you away? After he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. When evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he alone was on the land. So all the disciples were in the boat in the sea, and he, would, he alone was on the land. Seeing them distressed in rowing, for the wind was contrary to them, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. It says here, see Job 9.8. So Job 9.8 says, he alone stretched, stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Isn't that interesting? And he would have passed by them. I notice that this is, this is what happens sometimes. It's like Jesus is right there and he's walking and, he, and you think he's going to be with, with, he's going to walk to the people, walk to his beloved disciples, but he's, he would have passed by them. It's like on the road to Emmaus, you know, when Jesus was walking with them. And it seems like he's going to go on walking by, just go on away from them. And he's like, they have to say, no, Lord, come. Or no, actually, in that point in time, they didn't understand it was the Lord on the road to Emmaus, excuse me. And so they had to say, no, no, don't go away. Don't go away. Come with us. right? So he would have passed by them. But they, when they saw him walking on the sea, supposed that it was a ghost. So they knew about ghosts back then, and the the disciples knew about it, and apparently they must have believed in ghosts, or believed that there was such a thing, uh, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But he immediately spoke with them and said to them, Cheer up! It is I. Now, in the original manuscripts, this is very, very important for you, for, for you to understand this. In the original manuscripts, it would say, I am. Cheer up. I am. Don't be afraid. For those of you who are kind of wondering, what is that? What do you mean by I am? You remember when Moses had the first encounter that he had with God at the burning bush. And he asked God, he said, God, what is your name? I need a name to go back to the children of Israel to tell them, you know, they would say, who is the God that you were talking to? Who, what's, who, what's his name? God, what's your name? What was the response? I am that I am. God said, go tell them that I am has sent you. Jesus here is identifying himself as the same God who was in the burning bush. The God and the Lord of all creation, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God of David, the God of Isaiah, the God of Jeremiah. The the I am. They call him the great I am. Can you imagine this scene? There's a windstorm. They're struggling to... It's, it's a windstorm. They're struggling to even keep the boat, I mean, on the, in the sea properly, rowing, rowing, rowing. Just keep, they're struggling. And Jesus is just like walking on the sea as if the wind didn't affect him at all. And they thought it was a ghost. No wonder they thought it was a ghost because they, they knew that ghosts were not... Affected by, I mean, you can't really blow a ghost away, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they cried out, and, and, and they were all troubled. But immediately he spoke to them, and he said, Cheer up, or be of good cheer. I am. Don't be afraid. They got into the boat with them. He got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. 
And they were very amazed among themselves and marveled. For they hadn't understood about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They didn't understand that what, who they were dealing with here. Yeshua, Yeshua was the creator, the God of all heaven and earth. They didn't understand about the loaves. They didn't understand that God just created bread and created fish. Multiplied the little that they had and just created it. As, it, as, as, they, as they dealt it out, he created it. And being the creator, they didn't understand that he was not subject to the wind. He wasn't subject to the waves. He created them. Cheer up. I am. Don't be afraid. Notice that the wind ceased when he got into the boat. It's like he wanted the wind to blow as strong as it was. He wanted them to see. It wouldn't have been so... I mean, it would have been awesome to see him, someone walking on the water without, even without a strong, strong windstorm whipping, up the, you know, whipping, whipping you up. But in the windstorm, he wanted them to see that even though you struggle to keep boat going, you struggle to even keep the boat in the water, Keep the boat and to row, 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 row. You struggle so much. The wind's not even blowing me over. I'm not even struggling at all. I'm just walking on the water. Walking in the middle of the storm. Why? Cheer up. I am. Don't be afraid. Verse 53. When they had crossed over, they came to, to land at Gennesaret. And moored to the shore. When they had come out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. Now, again, you notice that Yeshua, you notice that Jesus did these real powerful miracles, like the transfiguration, the walking on the water. Not in front of all of the, the, the multitude, not in front of the whole country. Only in front of his chosen few. You know, he's not... What should I, how am I going to put this? He does, he's not concerned. He doesn't want to show, to show off to people who don't believe. Atheists, he, you know, it's almost like he can care less whether or not they see a miracle. He doesn't even want them to see a miracle to believe. I mean, he knows that they wouldn't believe anyway if they saw a miracle. They would just write it off as something else. But he did these real powerful demonstrations of his glory and of his power, of his presence and being, of who he really was, only with the chosen few. And even today, only the chosen few really know who Jesus really is. Not everybody that goes to church. No. By far. By far not. But there is a chosen, chosen few, the rem remnant that God has saved for himself that really knows. So when he came out of the boat, uh, verse 55, they ran about the whole region and began to bring those who were sick on their mats to where they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages or into cities or into the country, they laid the sick into the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch the fringe, the tassel, the seat seat. Look it up. Look it up. My, look it up, friends. Look it up later. The seat seat. T-Z-I-T. Right. You know, T-Z-I-T. -T, seat seat. Okay. They might touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched were made well. Because touching that tzitzit is reaching your hand out to the Torah. It's a, it's a, the tzitzit was a symbol. Was a, it served as a, a memorial. It served, it served to remind you to obey the commandments of God. So when they saw the tzitzit, they knew, that reminds me of to obey the Torah, and then to reach out and to actually touch it. 
was a sign of turning away. It was a sign of reaching beyond yourself, getting out of your skin, so to speak, getting out of your selfishness, out of your pride, out of your lust, out of your lust, the eyes, lust, the flesh, the sinful lust, the immoral lust, the sexual lust. Get out of that and to reach to the commands of God. A sign of, of, of shuva, of repentance, of turning, of change. And as many as did were made well. Those of you who are listening, if you want to be made well, get your priorities straight. The pri priorities are that you get right with God as much as you can. Take it seriously. Take the law of God seriously as we have it in the Bibles today. Okay. As we read throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and then some. Okay. I say and then some because some, some Bible, it depends what Bible you're talking about. I mean, you talk about the typical Protestant Bible, you don't have much in there, but you can talk about the Ethiopian Bible, it's got a lot in there. By the way, the Ethiopian Bible is more true to the ancient the ancient, uh, the, the, the days of Christ, by the way. And that's another whole session right there to tell you about that. But repent. Get serious. Get serious with God. Am I living right? Am I thinking right? Am I just doing what I'm doing and saying what I'm saying because I want to justify my sin? Justify my lifestyle? Justify my selfishness justify my lust or am I doing it because I re I, I'm really a lover of truth remember remember friends truth is not always a pleasant thing lies can be very pleasant but truth is not always a pleasant thing and people are not always drawn to truth they would rather live and believe a lie because it gives them temporary comfort. Don't be like that. Don't be like the, the multitudes. The, as Jesus said, many are on the road to destruction. The wide, wide path that most people are on. But there's the straight, the straight in the narrow. Which is a hard path to walk. And few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. Seek it. Seek it with all your heart. Seek God with all your heart, as the scriptures say. And promises you, you will find him. May God give you enrichment, revelation, beyond that of all your peers. May you be blessed as you meditate upon this that we're, we're talking about in this session. Meditate upon His Word. Meditate upon the Scriptures. May God bless you abundantly and lead you into ways of repentance and, and ways of the Lord like you've never like you never knew existed. So you can also teach others. God bless you and thanks again for listening and watching.